So yeah, um, we're here to uh, kind of talk about the magic that happens when you take digital technology and blend it with physical, uh, physical, physical awareness. Really, really, even if you use, even if you use um, uh, stock hardware, like a sensitivity to the physical objects you're manipulating and how, and how that works. So. Um, I asked everyone to just do a little, uh, just to get things started, to do a little intro and in like two minutes of background on everyone's work. And also to uh, just, because we have a pretty diverse panel of game installation designers of various platforms, to just kind of start off with how they approach this intersection and what the, what the intersection of physical and digital means to them. Um, so I'm going to start with myself really quick. My name's Gabe. Hi. Um, I'm a game designer and uh, I build playful technology of all sorts. Um, I had uh, an installation here called the Hearst Collection, which is a live action laser maze art heist game where you navigate a real, uh, a real net of lasers to try and grab the masterpiece and bring it back without tripping any of the sensors. Um, I work at The Go Game, which is the company that builds live action, location-based urban scavenger hunts. Um, so I've always, in a lot of my work, I'm dealing with location and pulling in the aspects of a real world place into my games. Um, I also do street games, uh, so from high tech to no tech. And also I, I veer outside of the games world into, um, into mapping. This is a game of uh, uh, massively multiplayer risk on college campuses and also into regular technology. I work on a startup called Woodcut Maps that takes the digital data of mapping information from Google Maps or OpenStreetMaps and uh, pulls it into a tangible product. So I guess how I, how I approach physical and digital is I think, the, I think basically the real world is the richest canvas there is. And while I love the, uh, while digital games uh, have amazing ability to build complete worlds inside your simulation engine. Um, I think they, that when you pull games out, and I had a really strong experience of this with the game of Risk on college campus, when you pull games out to tie into aspects that are real aspects of people's lives, the places they live, their real world data, um, uh, the objects that they interact with, uh, games can take on more meaning and more relevance. So I sort of try and take that weaving of real world relevance with virtual worlds into everything I do. Can I? Yeah. Uh, it's possible to see in notes as well, or, or I, I'll just wing it. Uh, it's, it's pretty easy. This is a presentation I did at GDC already, so I'm sorry if uh, it's a repeat for anyone. Uh, so, I'm Henry Smith, you probably all know me uh, as the voice actor of Male Civilian 3 in Freedom Force. Uh, <coughs> since, since then I've worked on uh, these games as a UI programmer. Um, and then last summer I quit my job to go indie. Um, I mostly work by myself, but I also get some help with my friends for, for music and art. It's Phil and Jeremy. Um, for my first, my first project, I wanted to, I wanted to do something really small um, and, and cooperative uh, that, that felt like a board game. Um, and I was, I was heavily inspired by uh, uh, you know, Sebastian Joust's use of technology to facilitate play. Um, and really, Doug should be up here instead of me because he does a lot more physical stuff than I do. Uh, uh, and I also watched a lot of Star Trek on Netflix. Um, so the way spacing works, if you don't know, is um, uh, it's, uh, two to four players. You will have a, a mobile device, a, a tablet, or a, a phone. Uh, the game uh, connects them together using technology. Um, everyone gets a control panel that looks kind of like this, uh, and they have to uh, complete the instructions that appear at the top of the screen. But the instructions aren't always for them; they're for the other players, and so they have to shout to each other and, and listen at the same time and read each other's body language uh, in order to keep the ship flying. Uh, and in the meantime, the ship is falling apart and you're being chased by an exploding star. Uh, after a few minutes of this, 
the ship explodes and everyone gets a medal. Um, and so yeah, I tried to I tried to keep it extremely small in scope. Um, I didn't give myself a lot, a lot of time, and I, I tried to uh, keep keep it just to the essential elements and only add things that that added to the chaos or, or the humor of the game, uh, because uh, it's a lot harder to play when when you're laughing. So um, yeah, that's me. Oh, and so uh, I guess uh, yeah. So the way I approach uh, the interaction between physical and digital is is just that. Right now, I'm, I'm really interested in, in the social dynamics of board games, how we can apply those to, um, to digital games, uh, but, uh, but like just stealing parts of it rather than doing a direct port of a board game. Come on. It, yes. It's working. Awesome. All right, Jean, you're up next. I can uh, do slides for you if you want. I'll just stem um, <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> my name is Jane Tingley. Um, as you know, I'm from Canada. I'm a... Um, I basically come at all of this from a very different direction. I come from a fine arts background, so I've started, <clears throat> I've been working with uh, responsive installation for the better part of a decade. So I usually work on my own on projects that are robotics or sound. Um, I started off with installation, um, and or inter uh, responsive installation, where a viewer w moves throughout a space and there's sort of a poetry that's created through your response, like all the actuators responding to your movement throughout space. And and here's another uh, view of uh, prepo response. Um, and now I've been moving more into uh, responsiveness. So responsiveness is there's actually generative behaviors that are sort of created as you move throughout a space. So uh, the next one is recollect. And this is something I just recently um, worked on with a collaborator, a sound designer. And so as the person moves throughout the space, you start to create different sound experiences. So um, a lot of the work that I was doing, you tend to create, at least in fine art context, is you create these sort of spaces that uh, allow for a poetry to happen, something that's less controlled or organized. And it's something where it's a bit more fluid. And so um, in parallel to my actual fine arts background, I've started working uh, on teams. And so on the next one, oh, this is a recollect again. Um, so on a team with an engineer and a fashion designer, we created the Dare Droid, or the Dare Droid. And so the Dare Droid is a cocktail-making cocktail dress that has a game of truth or dare built into it. And this was uh, designed for a festival, and it would happen really, really spontaneously. But this was a really important part for my practice, because I started to work in an entirely different way with people and to develop projects that weren't necessarily within the fine arts context. So this uh, has a model that moves out and plays with people, truth or dare, and as you interact with her, uh, she, the, the dress actually develops a cocktail for you, and then you get to drink it. So, you go into the next one. so this is the upgrade, Dare Droid 2.0, and we made this for the Electro Festival in 2011. Um, and so I'm going to end with Propinquity, which was uh, my other, my most recent project. I did it at the Technoculture Art and Games Research Center. We call it TAG at Concordia University in Hexagram. I started managing the TAG space, uh, and I started to start to see games in a different way because I was not, I was very new to gaming. And I think that what I really struck me about games is that they provide a context. Where games are about understanding, where you have to learn a system, understand the system, and play with the system. So I found that very, very interesting. So Propinquity sort of uses all the same uh, tools as I use in my own inter uh, responsive and interactive installations, but it's, uh, it's got rules that people need to learn how to follow and to play with, and uh, that I find very interesting. And I feel like that's one thing, the digital and the physical, that you can actually measure things, and you can actually um, learn systems, and then you can play the games through those systems. Yeah. And yeah, did you have a thought on like the physical and digital and how you? Yeah. All right. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, I guess when I think about the why the dis digital and the physical, it's really complicated because I think the digital brings to the table um, a set of rules or a set of systems, and we can interact with that system, and it sort of uh, addresses embodiment and sort of our physical experience of being in a space. And through that embodiment, it sort of opens up the avenue for um, sort of uh, emergent behaviors, and it creates the possibility for meaning to be made in maybe not so obvious ways. Uh, that would be why. Hi, I'm Kaho Abe. I make games and uh, media art, and they overlap. Um, <laughs> this is. 
This is uh, one of the first uh, things I made uh, with circuits. So I make a lot of custom interfaces for the games that I make because um, I want to create interesting inf interfaces that bring digital games out into the physical world um, to encourage people to play face to face. So this is actually the first one of the first things I made um, with circuitry stuff, and it's a five five five. Uh, two of them. Um, a lot of people know it as the Atari Punk console. Uh, but uh, I put two of them together um, in this project that I did with a friend of mine named Prithvi. Um, and we put like an LED with a photoresistor, uh, uh, an LED from one board to, to the other one that was reading it through a photoresistor and the same relationship going the other way around. So we created this face-to-face -face interactive um, device that would sort of um, change uh, sounds as you move different knobs and stuff and change your uh, partner sound um, and you go back and forth. The face-to-face -face interaction was interesting. Um, and then that led me to start making uh, actual games um, with this concept in mind. Uh, this is Hit Me, where you hit the other person on the button and it takes a <laughs> photograph of the other person. And then if you can see uh, the other person in the photograph, um, then you get extra points. Um, and it's physicality uh, is pretty intense sometimes. <laughs> Uh, another game is Ninja Shadow Warrior, um, where uh, it's an arcade game where you make funny poses uh, uh, because it gives you these random objects to fill out, and then you realize that more people actually fill them, fill objects out more accurately because of all the shapes and the edges involved, and more elbows makes it higher points, and so you get these goofy photographs of people. Next slide, please. Um, and then uh, this is Mary Mac 5000. Uh, uh, another game uh, where you where there were custom uh, vest and glove interfaces uh, where people uh, play Mary Mac but uh, reintroduced as a heavy metal rocker game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is Ninja Shadow Warrior. I, the slides got messed up. I messed them up. Oh. This is from the Ninja one before. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Um, and then this is Don't Wake the Bear, which I made with Ramsey, who's right there. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and that's, we're showing it in the tabletop games. Maybe today, I don't know if we're showing it today also, but um, it's, a, it's a PlayStation mobile game where you pass it around between people, but one device, but only use one device. And then that sort of uh, social interaction between people becomes very important also, like the banter and the trash talking and such. Um, and then finally, I am making a game that uses costumes as game controllers, and it's a two-person game. One person collects power, and their power capsule lights up. As they collect power, the other person shoots power, and they have to hold hands in order to transfer the power from one player to the other. And that happens in this humongous dome thing that I sewed together, um, and uh, hopefully, yeah, it brings people together in an in unusual kind of way. Right. Um, yeah. And would you want to tell us a little bit about how you, uh, how you, what, what is your approach to physical and digital and the combination of them? Um, my approach is that this this face to face interaction is like the key to everything, <laughs> mm -hmm. and um, and that experience is richer than anything. And um, and so, how do I manipulate technology or use technology as a tool to? to encourage that and to create a space for that. Mm -hmm. Cool. So yeah, I guess my first question, it seems like all of us have a real focus on face-to-face -face interaction, and that's sort of what draws us to this specific area, as opposed to digital and even single-player games. What does technology have to add? Like, so often technology comes in the way of face-to-face -face interactions. So what, what, what can it add to it, and how do you, how do you make it not uh, avoid the, the fallbacks of technology interfering with face-to-face -face interaction? For anyone. <laughs> uh, well, in my case, um, I, I've thought about how to potentially make Space Team as a card game or, or a board game uh, with, you know, cards as the control panels and, like, a sand timer or something. But it just, it, there's a lot, there's too much, uh, there's too much sort of, uh, uh, I don't know, like, 
extra things you'd have to do just to and, and keep up. You got to stay honest, and you got to keep watching the timer, and you got to make sure that the, the that the cards work out. And so and so, there's just a lot of stuff there that gets in the way. And so, um, technology can help with 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 those kinds of things. And uh, mm -hmm. and 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 yeah, I can have a lot more cards in the deck, as it were, for for all the different. Uh, uh, control panel names and everything. Uh, so, so yeah, I think uh, in my, my case, it just it just does all the all the, the menial drudge work that, that humans are, are, are bad at, or, mm -hmm. uh, or computers can do much faster, and, and it lets uh, it lets the, the, the humans get on with stuff they do, like like shouting at each other. Sorry, if you like, I can just kind of keep. Well, throwing I questions. I mean, we, we can just kind of take this pretty free form, I think. Sorry? We can take this pretty free form. Okay, uh, Well, I was just <laughs> thinking, we were just talking about it earlier, about why digital, like what does the digital bring or interfaces bring to these sorts of games? And um, I was thinking that in, like that creates, I mean, at least for like, I was looking at, what was it, Sound Bites Live last night, and everyone, that's what it's called, right? Sound... Oh, Sound Dodger? Sound Dodger Live, yeah. that's it. And uh, I was trying to figure out like what the technology brought to this. And it's yeah. basically, I feel like the technology brings a certain set of rules mm -hmm. that people can, sh like, they have to adhere to in order to actually play the game. But there's all this other stuff that happens around it. And these games become extremely social. And uh, as people try to negotiate the system, I mean, like, proximity detectors, I mean, they may or may not be glitchy, but at the same time, they're still sort of measuring distances and you're either there mm -hmm. or you're not there and so if you can just sort of you have these sets of rules that you have to function within and then you can sort of have this playfulness that happens around it and mm -hmm. then you have crowds that start to egg you on and you have more dynamic and interesting experiences and it's just like these it's a simple rule set yeah and then you know that that's what you get to play with i've noticed that with um with the hearst collection like the um the technology is almost more of a referee than a game exactly where it it's you're not interacting with the technology; it's just there for sort of some uh, aug augmented aug augmented sort of objectivity to it. Um, Keeps you honest. Yeah. Um, though though also in the in the case of the Hearst collection, it ends up often being that the crowd the crowd augments the the, the technology. When the technology fails, the sort of crowd will come in. Did you have something? Yeah, I was going to say, so my background is in fashion design, and often I see like a lot of similarities between fashion and technology, and one of them is that people get blindly in love with certain things about technology, right? And mm -hmm. so like your game mm -hmm. is about lasers. People love lasers. People <laughs> really love lasers. Your game yeah. is about spaceships and flying them. People love spaceships, come on. <laughs> and then, have you seen Propinquity? It's like this beautiful game, you know? And like people dancing, it looks like people dancing and everything. Mm -hmm. And I mean, all these things, people are mesmerized by, I mean, we do stupid things with technology. We buy iPhones and the phone part, at least in New York, doesn't work. Like there's, <laughs> you know, but we still like hold on to our iPhone. I'm embarrassed now, but um, we we hold on to our iPhones. Like people, we there's this aspect of you know technology that that is drawing us like moths to you know. But at the same time, sorry, I I feel like all of our games are sort of more about augmenting a normal human experience than about the technology. Like I'd say all of our games use technology, but. Really, like for the, for the Hearst collection, it's sort of the fantasy of a heist that it's augmenting. So, did you ever consider just doing the Hearst collection with red strings, like? A it's no fun. Strings? It's, still it's fun. no fun because um, this this happens whenever the the sort of technology breaks down, and when a human comes in and has to referee it, you get all these weird social dynamics where, like, it, it, because it's a subjective, so now it's like, oh, do I? give you a pass on that, do I not? Like, if I have to call you out each time. Um, there's just all this uncertainty that having the, the technology avoids. But at the same time, it's still just a layer. It's just a layer, but it's an essential layer. Um, it wouldn't be nearly as fun, I think, with, with just the strings. Well, then it becomes like physically awkward. 
right? Mm -hmm. You have the strings, and right. then it gets caught and things start falling. I mean, the, the idea is that we're dealing with physical reality, and technology has this beautiful, invisible way of measuring reality so that right. we're not actually having a physical, we're not tripping over ourselves. Did you try Propinquity with like um, a paper prototype or like yeah. a non-digital? Well, we tried all sorts of things, um, just trying to understand how we could use, we tried a tethering version of Propinquity where we were tethered together through proximity with our hands and then we've tried with multiple players and mm -hmm. we tied our arms together with strings mm -hmm. and uh, it just sort of physically just felt, it, I don't know, it just was never very exciting. <laughs> Um, so we ended up just sticking with this version, but yeah, the mm -hmm. paper prototyping it, part is very interesting because it helps you understand what it is you're trying to create, but it's really, it's this, mm -hmm. this unconnected thing that's somehow letting you know through uh, vibration or through blinking lights. Uh, it's a w relearning a new system and learning how to think differently. I think that's the exciting part. Mm -hmm. Do you think a big part of what makes some of our projects exciting is the custom technology. Like, is it the specialness? Because I noticed, you know, Henry, like, you, you built, made your game on an iPhone, which is standard technology, standard technology, but with incredible sensors that are largely unutilized by most games. And you've kind of just used it to the fullest. And I noticed, Kaho, you, um, you're working on a, a PS Vita game, but still, like, using it to its fullest. Like, what, what do you think of, like, in terms of, like, like stock phone technology getting better. Do you think we'll get to a point where many of these games can exist on standard technology, or will there always be a need to build something unique for your for whatever you dream up? No, there's so actually, there's a lot of space uh, within that whole spectrum of different things. I mean, for example, with cell phones and stuff, there's like you could create so many uh, peripherals for a cell phone that hides the cell phone and you can't see it, but then, mm -hmm. you know, uh, let's say like, you know, you, you make a huge hat or something and it has a cell phone in it, and then mm -hmm. you play the game through the hat, um, you know, taking advantage of all the technology that the cell phone has. Um, I mean, we, ha we have barely started to explore that area, I feel like. Um, so there's, a, there's still a lot of things that can be done. Um, I mean, but in terms of creating custom interfaces, I mean, you can, can definitely make things from scratch, you know, it just takes a lot of time and a lot of things break. But I think also, um, I think the world is interested in that right now. I think that there's mm -hmm. a lot of, like, the hype curve is going upwards and it's looking at objects in general and it's sort mm -hmm. of like coming back to the object. Sort mm -hmm. of, we went into the screen and now there's you sort of, it's re-emerging in the world and I think... I mean, me as a builder, I, I love building my own custom interfaces. I love, for me, that's a, a very pri like a personal love, but I think that people enjoy working, up, like otherwise you wouldn't have maker fairs and DIY days. And so I think mm -hmm. that people want to, I don't know, I just think it's, a, it's an interesting thing that's sort of people are thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the technology is getting easier. And more accessible. So what, what's um, each of your like dream platform? Like if you could have any piece of technology to build a, an experience or game on, what would you, what would you conjure? Pro probably the holodeck, right? Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> fully, fully tangible virtual reality uh -huh. every around you. That's a pretty, pretty, pretty silly answer though. <laughs> Wait, the heart of the what? Oh, the holodeck, 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 right, holodeck right, right. from Star Trek. For me, it's hard to really say. I think I think about, I try to think about the game and the interactions before, be, mm -hmm. interactions between people before I think about the technology and what technology would be suitable for that interaction. Uh, so I'm not really thinking that much about, I wish I had this high tech, you know, system. Right. I tend to agree with Kaho on that. Um, but at the same time, um, I'm really interested in the actual building parts, so I'll always mm -hmm. be working with physical reality in that sense, but uh, I'm really interested in ways that the digital and the physical can have pure equality, like ways that allow interactions to be both physical and digital, ways of merging these things where you use the mm -hmm. affordances of both in mm -hmm. interesting ways, and I don't know what that means, but um, it's something I think it's worth exploring. The afford, yeah, so how, 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 how would those sort of like blend I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I'm working on a project right now that's based on the Internet of Things, sort mm -hmm. of uh, technologies controlling or objects and 
connected through technologies and people interacting that way. And it's just a, it's a research project for me now, but it's something that I'm thinking about a lot. Mm -hmm. And also, like, just really, for, but but like that. I feel like there there are kind of two there there's sort of a back and forth right there's like digital technology, um, giving information to the to physical reality, and then there's phys technology sensing sensing reality and having sort of what happens in the real world affect what goes on in the virtual sort of simulation in the reverse. I don't know really where to take that. That was an unconnected thought, but um, um, I know I guess I. Always, in my experience building more location-based game, I always felt like the challenge was never in the sensing, it was always in having the, what goes on in a simulation or a fictional world affect the real world, like having those outputs. I don't know if it's changed, I don't know, I don't know if that's developed lately, like gotten easier. What do you mean? What kind of outputs like would you want oh, for like the highest collection, for example? Well, with um, I don't know. I guess with the the game of Risk on college campus, the dream was always to have like um, these like flags on the trees, and the flags would change color based on which territory was which team owned which territory. So like full full um, invasion of the game into real space, and I guess. Displays and technology and like uh, projectors. I can, yeah, it's funny. I could think of a, a bunch of ways to do that now that were not feasible a few years ago. Yeah, I mean, we're we're, we're yeah. blending uh, technology into clothing, as as Kaho knows. And so, yeah, maybe maybe you will have flags that change color in just a few years. Yeah, and you'd be able to do that. So, what do you guys think of? I mean, I mean, I guess um, um, going into that sort of integration. What do you guys think of virtual reality and augmented reality, like? Like, yeah, just like it seems like a challenge to this, right? Because it's like, um, okay, well, I mean, in having games invade the actual real world is hard. So let's just invent overlays where we have all the freedoms we have in with digital technology, and we just sort of overlay them on your eyes, either in a half and half kind of way or in a full immersion kind of way. But we kind of take this opposite standpoint where we're like, no, we're going to do it the hard way. So. Like, has the easy way tempted you? <laughs> uh, I, I think I think uh, augmented reality has a pretty long way to go before it, before it can it can feel right. I mean, and if you if you have a game where everyone has a, like an Oculus Rift mm -hmm. headset or uh, everyone has Google Glass and they can see things, then you just have a bunch of people like wandering around. No one else knows what they're doing, <laughs> um, uh, and they'll probably be bumping into things and stuff. So I think uh, I think because because our like you can spectators can usually tell what's happening in, in our games uh, because. Uh, because it's not just a private view for right, in front of someone's eyes. So I think I think that's a, that's a problem. I think, um, uh, but uh, but I think there's there's a lot of potential there. I think. No, you're it's a key, like the share the sharedness and the universality of it is is gone uh, with those technologies. Yeah, it's more private, and and so it, yeah, there's not as much there's not as much about sharing exactly. Yeah, I'd have to agree. It's the it's it's a very. Um, it's an intentionally social experience, the stuff that we're doing. Um, it's about what happens between individuals, people who woke up and maybe had a bad day, people who have mm -hmm. memories. It's like this real physical embodiedness. Mm -hmm. And we come to these installations, or whether they be art installations or games or whatever, uh, with all that stuff. And I feel like virtual reality and the overlays tend to take us away from that more. Mm -hmm. um, but I, at the same time, you know, augmented reality potential has potential, but in sort of a, a different context, I think, than the physical mm -hmm. and uh, digital discussion. Yeah. The touch on spectatorship and the sharedness, I think that's, I, I maybe hadn't connected why spectatorship was so important to this kind of um, blend of games now, and, but I think it's that, it's that, it's that technology is, uh, m most of the technology we use on a day-to-day -day basis is like single player, and we, uh, we build multiplayer tech environments. Do you guys have any good, like, stories about spectatorship or just like what 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 how you try and involve spectators and in in play in observation in the worlds you know we create uh well yeah i mean uh, space team is great for that because uh it's really easy to see how how the game works just by watching people play it for five seconds and and often like if someone someone is having trouble uh uh someone watching behind them will, will 
get it and, and like like tell them what to do or, or actually touch their screen and like help them. So you mm -hmm. can have you could have two people playing on one on one screen. Um, and you know there are no explicit rules about that kind of thing. So so it's great if people are having fun doing that, then then they can and and people yeah some people sometimes people set all the all the iPads up in a row so they can all mm -hmm. see everybody's and. Uh, and it's pretty hard to play like that, but uh, but it, it's just another way of doing it. That's um, so so yeah, and and a lot of these games are fun just to watch as well as to play, and yeah, in a way that yeah, uh, an augmented reality game you wouldn't be able to tell what was going on. It might be fun to watch people bump into each other, but right. Well, with them, um, <coughs> like. Propinquity is a research project, and so it came out of a research space at Concordia. And so we tried all sorts of different things with Propinquity. And so like the, ba the main game mechanic was sort of how can we have proximity being a central game mechanic. Mm -hmm. So we also thought of proximity with the audience and bringing the audience in so that they could actually start to like basically use the circle as a bounding circle and have the audience sort of have their hands out and so that even the audience can score against you. Mm -hmm. We thought about giving the audience some sort of clicker so that they could say, no, 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 you touched, because we didn't have the actual touch mechanic. Like, mm -hmm. we say you can't touch in propinquity, but at the end of the day, there's no penalization, so we thought about handing that over to the audience. <coughs> and I think that all these discussions became possible because the audience is such a fun fundamental part of the experience of propinquity and, like, hit me and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 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 For uh, the spectators, for me, not only are they important for you know making the experience uh, exciting and like you know cheering on different players or whatever, um, they're potentially the next players in the in the rotation, um, and mm -hmm. you know showing them like you just said, showing them uh, uh, that it's a simple game to understand and that they can do it too is often a, a very good thing for public space games that are. Uh, are connected in public spaces, um, yeah. Right, like the mod that modeling happens with digital games, but it's so slow. It happens really fast with our games. I like noticed it happened just happened like lightning with Joust and with a lot of other games yeah. where you just see someone playing, and you're like, bam! I see how this works. I want in. Okay, well. Um, uh, I, I want to get away from them. Maybe the all, so we've we've talked a bit about all like the fun the fun parts of this. So I want to I guess talk a little bit about the challenges and what makes this um, this area of exploration I think particularly hard um, because it demands uh, just kind of physical games are physical games board games card games they're a genre they're they're experts in that field digital games is a genre. There are experts in that field. Like um, blending them together requires both expertises, and just like so, yeah. I mean, um, I, I guess to start, like, I mean, have like, um, I guess, like, what. Right, I'm I, can, I can talk about <laughs> yeah. all the bad things that happen. Okay, talk about the bad things. <laughs> okay. So um, my stuff breaks all the time, I mean, especially with something like hit me, like you're hitting the other person on the head, so like you know things get smashed. I travel with backups and backups and backups of mm -hmm. my games, um, and you know my trunk is usually like 95% my game, and then like 5% toiletries and fucking <laughs> like outfit oh, yeah. or something. And you know, I print out like letters to to the TSA in case they open up my bag, so they know that I'm not right. carrying a bomb um, and stuff like that. And it like breaks all the time. I bring soldering irons to shows so that I can fix things on the spot. It's like a pain in the butt. It really mm -hmm. is. Yeah. No, I know it. <laughs> yeah, I guess my like I kind of like big question there is like why why do we go through all this trouble? No idea. <laughs> Yeah. Because we like to do stuff, like mm -hmm. build stuff. No, like even yeah. last night we had propinquity and I have no idea what happened. Like we played it over and over and over again and I think the radio waves, all the Bluetooth signals were mm -hmm. up and around and, and our radio the radio waves got clogged and all of a sudden our patches weren't updating. So you have these moments of complete failure. But I mm -hmm. think failure comes with technology. I mean that's a part of it. But then there's these moments of brilliance and I mean mm -hmm. it just makes it worthwhile. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Backups. That's the answer. Lots of backups. Lots yeah. Of backups. 
Yeah, yeah, duplicates. I, I only had one of each piece of technology. So, yeah, I mean, this ties with me. Like, uh, I'll, I'll start, which is like, yeah, if you're going to do something like this, like, have two of each part. Because <laughs> um, the hardware. Building, like, um, the biggest issue with Hearst Collection is the, um, the connections. I had to, like, hand build each of those wire connections. And there are probably... Three no three hundred connections so nine hundred individual like um, wire to wire connections to the Hearst collection. If any one of them goes out and like I hand crimped each of these, like something will flake out. So uh, I I don't have a good answer to that, but I guess backups. I I mean I tried to make it as as replaceable as possible with all like repeating components, and it's still like figuring out which connection. And that, that's kind of the challenge of this sort of homebrew stuff, where you're prototyping. You're not, um, you're not, uh, you know, at the point where you have that polish. So yeah, I was wondering, do we have any like tips for people? Like I imagine that people are here because they're interested in this. Did you make any like rookie mistakes or, or or easy failures that you would could some wisdom you can impart on people going about this for the first time to help them avoid what you what you suffered. I think one of the most unexpected thing about the things, uh, the games that I make, is that when I run them, it takes a lot of energy to like, mm -hmm. you know, because it's almost a performance in a way, um, and I'm interacting with people on a very intense level. I feel like, you know, um, and uh, I think that you have to kind of be ready to put yourself into mm. it physically. Like I get so exhausted sometimes. Yeah. Um, and, but I think that that, I mean, that's part of it. I think uh, the biggest thing is that, I mean, we just talked about it, backups. I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, you're creating something and it's an idea. And the moment an idea sort of meets reality, there are things that are going to fall apart. Like uh, we were just discovering that our circuit boards are kind of, because we did a specific type of circuits where they're not through hole, they're just sort of soldered onto the surface, surface mount. And we discovered that them sitting on um, a fairly rigid base is actually bending the circuit board, so actually breaking the soldering connection. So mm -hmm. you can't think that before it happens. It's something that's going to happen. So you just need to make sure you have at least four backups for everything. I never travel without so many different backups. I mean, this radio wave issue that we had here, I mean, I don't even know how to think about that, but I'll try to come up with another plan for that one in the future. But I mean, it's uh, you can't predict what reality is going to present you with, so yeah. you just have to be as prepared as possible and also be willing to accept a bit of failure. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. So yeah. Oh, I was going to say the yeah. Space Team doesn't involve custom hardware, obviously, so, so I, don't, I don't need all the backups, uh, and I don't envy you guys of having to do that, but, uh, but the networking code in Space Team was, uh, was a pain to, yeah. to do. It was, it was surprisingly difficult to get things connected, uh, especially on, on on Android. In my phone, it was uh, at least there's only like a few different devices. But on Android, I didn't actually do uh, the work myself. Another company did it. But, but it was, there are like 4,000 different Android devices that all have different levels of support for Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and different operating system versions. And, and I had to make a lot of compromises. And it doesn't work as well on Android. It's not, the collection process isn't quite as smooth. So um, yeah, if you're doing a, a local networking game, uh, you should probably start on an iPhone because uh, Android uh, support is going to be very annoying and frustrating. Did you run into any issues specifically with the gestures with Space Team? Um, occasionally, people, again, on, on Android, people had trouble flipping. Uh, well, everyone has trouble flipping because, because nobody knows how to do it because I made it intentionally vague. Mm -hmm. uh, but I kind of liked the fact that, uh, that that became sort of folklore, how do I avoid wormholes? Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, but on Android, some people had problems flipping and I didn't understand why, and it turns out that there's a, there's a setting in the, pre in the system preferences that disables motion control, and so if you have that turned off, none of that stuff's gonna work. Mm. Uh, so, uh, but no, otherwise, um, you know, the accelerometer, uh, sh the shake is a pretty easy gesture, and, and flip is just turning it upside down. But those are pretty th easy things to detect, so I didn't really have a, much of a problem with that. So one uh, one last question, I guess for oh uh, one two maybe uh, one for this is more for Kaho and Jane, but like fun physical games. Well, for everyone, physical games, especially games that don't use um, the platforms that are out there. Like finding a platform is really hard. How 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 do you um, 
how do you think about distribution for your games? Are you trying to make sort of niche experiences for small groups of people? Are you trying to bring them out to mass audience? Like, how, how would you do that? Is it even possible? Um, I don't, I don't know. I just, mm -hmm. I, I mean, the, it kind of pains me sometimes when I know that people like who download games um, on, in the iTunes store that, you know, there's tons of people who play that game, but uh, only, you know, a few tens of people will be able to play my games at a time. Um, and, but at the same time, like there's, I mean, there's nothing else I can really do about that. And if I do uh, think about it too much, then it takes away my time from actually making things and um, and for me it's more important to keep on making stuff and then trying to show it and then make it and show it. But, this, but your latest game is on a, an existing platform so is that a result of you trying to go more mass market or? No, it's like a result of a game jam. Oh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. um, I think that in a lot of ways, these uh, the games um, they fit into a fine art model, like exhibition mm -hmm. style. So mm -hmm. you you go to an exhibition and you see a game. And I mean, artists make. Uh, I know that I'll take like prepful response. The piece I showed took me a year and a half to build, and I've shown it you know a handful of times, maybe ten times, and. Uh, I'm really happy with that because I feel as though I've sort of managed to go into the world and shown it. Um, I think that a lot of these games fit into that model, but then there's more and more festivals like the one that happened at the Gaiety Lyrique in Paris, uh, which was a game exhibition. And so we, you know, you get to bring these stuff to more and more places. Mm -hmm. um, but that said, I mean, I'm also very interested in thinking through ways that you can do this type of, um, how you can distribute this. And I'm all also very interested in DIY and, and being able to download these things in, as kits, like Propinquity the Kit. Mm -hmm. And I've sort of thought about those ways as well that make it more accessible so that people can play, you know, download Propinquity and get the kit and play it in their living room. I mean, those are all possibilities, but then it's like, do you really want to take it to that next step? Yeah. No, or do I, you want to move on to the next project? Yeah, I thought about that with Hearst Collection, but it's just so daunting, the uh, amount of effort and the cost and the quantity you need to get the cost down and manufacturing challenges. Yeah, I, I think uh, we talked about this earlier, but I think that uh, we need to bring arcades back for this specific mm -hmm. purpose so we can have dedicated spaces to play, to play uh, uh, Hit Me and, and Joust and Propinquity. And then each arcade can buy, buy one or two copies of the, of the games uh, or, or commission them to be made or something. And then, uh, because, because we need a, a space where people gather anyway, to, to, you know, so you can get a, a, a critical mass of people uh, watching and playing. Um, because yeah, I think the, if you if you have the individual, uh, if you have a game at your house, then you have to somehow find all those people to play yeah. it. And so, uh, and yeah, also it's harder to to produce it in scale like that. So I think that's a good reason for bringing back arcades. Yeah, arcades had all the, had this magic, had everything that I think. Yeah, that. Um, we're, we're kind of trying to bring back into games that sort of face-to-face -face experience. Arcades all had that, and yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sad that they, I guess just the, the, the game, the manufacturers kind of, or the game manufacturers, I guess, didn't keep up with game trends, right? Like, new game development just outstripped them. It makes me think of, like, components, right? Like, I think for my... I've gotten more reliability with my products by just use, trying to use more trusted components, like trying to build as little as possible um, and just kind of using Arduino or using like a laser module that has most things built in and just kind of doing the glue. And I wonder if the arcades have sort of a similar model where if you have like a sort of repeatable components for that physical, for the physical aspect and you can just sort of swap in and out software I don't know, that's a big question of like what what could make arcades a viable a viable uh, model again. Um, so yeah, w one last question, which is, f so fundraising. I mean, as we mentioned, like fundraising is hard for these because the capital requirements are so much higher. Have, it, has, has, have any of you raised funds for a game that has had a physical manis manifestation? Like, um, how would you even if you could, or is that sort of not even in the question, like something you're thinking about? Well, I, I'm not sure. But I mean, for me, I'm, I'm applying to 
like Canada Council and mm. Ontario Council of Arts because I'm, I'm sort of framing these pieces as art projects and mm. so I'm looking them as grants, things that I develop and then I exhibit. Yeah. So that's how I've been approaching it. Is it like, I mean, for me, it's just kind of been like a labor of love, like personally funded. Well, I guess actually, no, the Hearst Collection is now sort of a go game product. So we're hoping to deploy it for, for client games. So that's something. Yeah, and, in my case, I, I self funded uh, Space yeah. Team. I had some savings. Um, uh, and it's making a little bit of money off the uh, in app purchases. But I think for my next project, I'm going to turn to crowdfunding and, and like a patronage model to see if people are willing to support me keep making new games um, and and yeah I think that like even though and a lot of people maybe get to play play your games um, uh, a lot of people have, have probably heard of you now or seen the games being played and so um, and so that might be a way of, uh, of encouraging people to, to help fund future projects uh, if they like they like what they see uh, my, my stuff is uh, crosses over with media art, uh, so mm. I get un art funding, uh, or I try to get it. <laughs> it seems, seems to be a theme. Try. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think that's it. Thanks, everyone. Thank